once again that it is being recorded. Um, welcome to everyone to this panel discussion on the Guardian's relationship with feminism over the years. Ah, here is uh, Lynn Siegel, who is, I'm just going to let in Lynn Siegel, who's one of our panelists. Yay, Lynn Siegel is back. Fantastic. Let me just make you a presenter, Lynn. Um, if I can find you on here, yes, here you are. I oh, know you are a presenter already. Fantastic. Um, okay, great. So welcome everybody um, to this uh, afternoon panel on the Guardian's relationship with feminism over the years. And it's, it's uh, well, it didn't probably didn't have much of a relationship with feminism in the earliest years, but in the uh, latter days of its 200-year history. Um, um, my name is Becky Gardner. I am a, a le senior lecturer here at Goldsmiths in the journalism department, but I was for many years a Guardian journalist until 2014 when I left. Um, I started the Guardian in 1998 as women's page editor, so it's quite fitting that I'm sharing this now. Um, it, it's a uh, it, it, it's an odd time to look back on because it was my first job at The Guardian. It's 1998 and I went to cover a maternity leave, even though, in fact, I had a baby myself who was only just turned four months old when I started the job. So it was quite emblematic, I think, of feminism in that period. Um, my, my main preoccupation then was work-life balance, I think. But um, anyway, so lots to talk about. I'm, fa I'm fascinated to hear people's reflections on the women's pages and on feminism and The Guardian in general. Um, so I'm very delighted to welcome our guests. And um, we have four um, speakers, two of whom are doing a paper together. So the first is Hannah Hamad, who is Senior Lecturer in Media and Communications at Cardiff, um, the author of Post-Feminism and Paternity in Contemporary US Film, Framing Fatherhood in 2014, and Film Fem Feminism and Rape Culture in the Yorkshire Ripper Years. In, um, which is forthcoming. It sounds very interesting. Um, Hannah is going to be talking about the early years of the Guardian's women pe women's page, so its founding editors and and its kind of uh, yeah the found foundations of the page, I guess. Um, Lynn Siegel is anniversary professor of psychology and gender studies at Birkbeck, University of London, and is the author of many books, including Beyond the Fragments with Hilary Wainwright and Sheila Rowbottom, a foundational second wave feminism text. Um, and Out of Time in 2013, and one of the co-authors of the Care Manifesto most recently. And Lynn is going to be talking about the Guardian's relationship to feminism broadly, with a particular focus on second wave feminism. And then our, our final two speakers, Jilly Boyce Kay, is lecturer in media and communications at the University of Le Leicester, and the author of Gender, Media and Voice. Communicative, communicative injustice and public speech. I can't speak publicly, obviously, in 2020. Um, and she's published widely on the relationship between feminism and media culture and is founding editor of the Cultural Commons short form section in the European Journal of Cultural Studies. And Mariella Fanibeka, which I hope I've got your name correctly, um, writer and tra translator living in Manchester and co author of Work work, labour and desire at the end of capitalism. And together they're going to be presenting a paper what they've called on, on what they've called trans exclusionary radical centrism. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to take the speakers in that order because it's also sort of broadly historical order. Um, Gollum, if you could turn off your video so that you don't get picked up in the recording, thank you. Um, and I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. There are 15 minutes for each speaker. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my own camera off now and when I reappear, that means you've just got your coming up to the end of your time. So try and keep an eye on the time yourself because I'm hoping that we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, and to the audience, please put your questions in the chat or raise your hands if you want to ask a question and we'll come to that at the end. So first of all, Hannah, if I can ask you to kick off. Um, uh, yes, fantastic. thank you, Becky. Thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, uh, share my slides and um, then I'll be ready to go. OK, uh, uh, hopefully you can see. Let me know if not, and I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, the coexistence of liberal feminist commentary and debate with discourse on the domestic arts and advice on how best to adhere to the feminine norms of the day was arguably the defining characteristic of the early decades of the Guardian women's page. And the ideological tensions produced by this coexistence have colored opinions about the need or not for the continued existence of newspaper women's pages ever since. 
All the same, it was the emergence and consolidation of women's pages that enabled, as Chambers, Steiner and Fleming have argued, the provision of a recognised space for discussing women's issues and the granting of a foothold for women in the male, the then male dominated profession of journalism. This became the case at The Guardian too, as the establishment of the women's page made space for women's journalists to set an agenda for women beyond the concerns of domesticity and beauty norms. Its early decades were shaped by the editorships of two women who pioneered the page, Madeleine Linford from 1922 to 39 and Mary Stott from 1957 to 72. In 1922, Linford, the only woman on the editorial staff, was asked by then editor C.P. Scott to institute and edit a women's feature. That feature became mainly for women and Linford went on to oversee it for the next 17 years setting the tone for an ideological double bind that would characterise women's pages for decades thereafter, Linford's editorial gave rise both to landmark pieces of politically charged feminist journalism by established and emerging women writers on the one hand, and advertiser-friendly fare concerning domesticity, consumer affairs and feminine beauty norms on the other. Feminist activist and writer Evelyn Sharp was incumbent at The Guardian when she became the first regular columnist for Linford's women's feature. She was not only a feminist, but also a pacifist, and she brought both commitments to her women's page writing. While in one column, she would decry the cult of domesticity in what she called the fetish of spring cleaning. In another, she would critique well-known anti-pacifism intimidation tactics as what she called the white feather complex. Winifred Holtby and Vera Britton, who went on to achieve major literary success, were emerging writers in the early years of Linford's women's feature and made early names for themselves, writing feminist journalism for The Guardian's women's page that engaged with key debates about feminist concerns, albeit adopting a highly classed mode of address in so doing that spoke rather specifically to educated white women uh, of some means and privilege. As Mary Stott later wrote from the vantage point of the post second wave feminist 1980s, one outstanding difference between the Manchester Guardian women readers between the two world wars and the Guardian readers of today is that in the 1920s and 1930s, contributors discussed domesticity on the assumption that in homes like theirs, there would be living in domestic help. Some parallels between the feminist debates taking place in the earliest years of the Guardian women's page and those at the turn of the millennium thus start to become more explicable. In attempting to intervene in debates about gender and the distinction between public and private public spheres public on the women's page women. in 1927, Holtby wrote that women have been told they cannot both marry and have a home and have a career outside the home, that they cannot preserve both domestic and professional proficiency that they cannot maintain a decorous and exquisite standard of taste in their own appearance and in their possessions, uh, and at the same time perform useful service to the public. Lauding those few who demanded that we will have both, she in some ways anticipates the rallying cry of we can have it all, so familiar to later Guardian readers from feminist debates about the dilemmas of work-life balance in the women's page writings of millennial post-feminism. She later wrote on the vexed question of gendered personal pronouns, arguing for the adoption of pronouns without gender, thus again taking up and anticipating a long running social and cultural debate about gender, which continues today. Elsewhere across the lifespan of Linford's women's page, readers were invited to consider all manner of what it offered up as quotidian domestic matters and consumer affairs. Unsurprisingly, Feminine beauty norms of the day were matters of interest to the readership, so a forecast of what women's issues were likely to come up in the next session of Parliament might sit alongside one of 1936's regularly running Beauty for the Busy Woman series of articles advising slash body shaming women on best practice in things like use of cosmetics, plucking, slimming and its treatments and how to deal with facial blemishes. These were accompanied by illustrations that depicted the presumed average guardian woman performing the self-surveilling labour of normative femininity. In line with feminist historian Angela John's characterisation of Linford's women's page as a mixture of continuity and change, 
the disruptive anti-patriarchal potentialities of some of the more political writings on women's social issues, status and rights by writers like Sharp and Holtby were thus arguably offset by the tacit acceptance of the status quo with respect to women's relationship to the domestic sphere and to normative femininity, normative white femininity, that characterized some of the other kinds of writing. Linford's ultimate successor as women's editor after a long hiatus for the page brought about by paper rationing as a result of the Second World War was of course Mary Stott. Looking back at their respective bodies of work during her retirement, Stott drew parallels between her own period of editorship and Linford's, but also identified differences that she saw as marking their respective eras as distinct and different from one another. These differences Stott views questionably as social rather than political, thus arguably glossing over the extent to which the social and the political are mutually constitutive and thus eliding important issues around race, class and sexuality. These were themes that became increasingly central to the feminist discourse that shaped the content of the page in her own period of editorship, which spanned the 1960s and saw the rise to prominence on both the women's page and in society and culture at large of second wave feminism and the UK women's liberation movement, uh, about which, of course, we're going to hear more from Lynn next. Mary Stott was hired to edit the women's page of The Guardian in 1957 carrying 30 years experience editing the women's pages of local and smaller publications. Under Stott's editorship, the focus of the women's page, including her own writings, shifted over time, further towards increasingly politically charged engagement with women's issues, arguably well ahead of the mainstream rise to prominence of feminism that was enabled by the subsequent emergence of women's liberation. As Catherine Whitehorn wrote in 1974, uh, uh, 75, I beg your pardon, uh, hardly a feminist pressure group in the 50s and 60s didn't get its impetus or even its origin on Stott's women's page. Hannah? Yes. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt, but your slides haven't been moving forward, but I seem to have control over them. Oh, what, what I'm slide, slide number now? nine, yeah. Becky, slide number nine. I'm nine. I'll now, if you tell me when to move them, I'll move them. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Are we there? Yeah, we're there. We have Mary Stott. Okay. Lovely. In 1962, Stott inaugurated Women Talking, which was a weekly opinion column that appeared on the women's page each Monday, often authored by Stott herself. It dealt with all manner of issues and debates of concern to women's lives. These included issues pertaining to women in both the public sphere and the domestic sphere, in various types of life situations across the class spectrum, although unsurprisingly often assuming whiteness to be a universal subject position and it addressed key concerns still relevant to feminist discourse and debate today. Things such as equal pay for equal work, or more specifically, what we now refer to as the gender pay gap, wherein women still do not get equal pay for equal work, women's work-life balance, the politics of marriage, and the politics of the body. Stott's inaugural Women Talking column offered up a defense of the continued necessity for women's pages in newspapers, focusing uh, on the importance of the covering uh, of covering issues that are of particular interest and importance to women, albeit the women's page did this mostly from a heteronormative perspective that addressed women uh, who were married uh, and or mothers. This was something that produced a degree of ambivalence about Stott and her feminism, uh, even amongst her fellow journalists, especially those attached uh, to more radical uh, although only relatively speaking, publications such as Feminist Monthly Magazine, uh, Spare Rib. Uh, next slide, please, Becky. Um, reviewing the first volume of Stott's autobiography for this publication in 1973, feminist writers Mandy Merck and Jane Kaplan gave her due recognition for what they described as her instinctive feminism, going on to describe her as a strong woman who created her own strength a woman who really likes women in a generation of lots who don't, and a prime example of the sisterhood, end quote. But within the same review, the authors are quick to turn their attention to what they highlight as Stott's omissions and shortcomings in her autobiographical musings on a number of topics of concern to second wave feminists, including things like marriage, motherhood, the nuclear family, uh, and feminist social reform. One of the reasons for their critique here seems to stem from the dissonance that they observed between Stott's apparent unwillingness or inability to acknowledge the intersections and overlap between issues of inequality that underpin feminist concerns 
and those that underpin Marxist concerns, symptomatic of broader disagreements that were taking place at that time between socialist feminists and liberal feminists. Uh, next slide, please, Becky. Specifically, Stott's championing of what she referred to as the joys of living in a nuclear family failed in the evaluation of Merkin Kaplan to account for the gender division of labour, which makes it such an efficient server of capitalism. Notwithstanding such critiques of the apparent narrowness of Stott's own feminism, in its final years under her editorship, the women's page became an important site of consciousness raising for what was unfolding in the UK to become the women's liberation movement and what the paper referred to as the new wave of feminism. Next slide, please, Becky. An early publication on the women's page in this regard was Ruth Adams' 1970 article, The New Feminism, which in its impassioned description of the impact being made in America by the National Organization for Women, was one of the first serious takes on the new wave of women's liberation in the US to be published in a UK newspaper. Jill Tweedy emerged as another important mainstream feminist commentator on the UK women's movement through her contributions to the women's page in the 1970s. Noteworthy early examples include feminists and the right to be ugly, her impactful position piece responding to debates in the new feminist movement about the body politics of womanhood and the political power of rejecting the trappings of normative femininity in one's personal appearance. Uh, and the words in action, uh, which was a write up of her participation in the first UK Women's Liberation March in March 1971. Next slide, please, Becky. Stott was succeeded first by Linda Christmas from 1972 to 75 and Suzanne Lowry from 1975 to 78, who thus saw The Guardian through the height of second wave feminism. They were followed by Liz Forgan from 1978 to 81, who saw Guardian readers through a darker time for the women's liberation movement as priorities shifted towards combating the social problem of men's violence against women. Next slide, please, Becky. This took place in tandem with the high profile case of the hunt for the serial murderer of women known as the Yorkshire Ripper. And indicative of this was that in 1978, freedom from intimidation by threat or use of violence and an end to all laws, assumptions and institutions which perpetuate male aggression towards women was added to the list of demands made by the Women's National Coordinating Committee at the National Women's Liberation Conference that year. A noteworthy flashpoint in how this manifested on the women's page came with the December 1980 publication of Jean Stead's Now is the Time to Stand Up and Fight, which she characterised at the time as a militant response to the menace of the Yorkshire Ripper. As Stead argued in The Guardian at the time, the search for the Ripper has become a focus for feminist thinking that will be far reaching, indicative of the extent to which these crimes had given rise to a major cultural flashpoint around men's violence against women. Next slide, please, Becky, and that's the final slide. <laughs> um, when France, Frances Cairncross took over the page in 1981, Britain was two years into the first Thatcher government. Political tides had turned sharply, second wave feminism had peaked, and the women's page was perhaps no longer the force for social change that it had arguably been in the most impactful years of first Linford's and then Stott's editorship. Thinking about the place of the Guardian women's page in the larger history of 20th century UK women's movements, it's worth remembering and emphasising that contributions of this page to these movements over time were largely, although not exclusively, to strands of liberal feminism and largely white liberal feminism at that. Liberal feminism envisioned a world in which it was possible for equality between men and women to be achieved through legal reform, lobbying, issue-based campaigning, and the belief that inequalities could be eradicated if women were able to exist and move through the world on the same terms as men. The contents of the Guardian women's page over the years has done much to propound such beliefs. This has made it easier to continually renegotiate its relevance to the lives of readers as political tides turned and feminist discourse gave way to post-feminist discourse from the Thatcher years onwards. To overemphasize this, uh, though, would be to do a disservice to writers who have used the page to question common sense assumptions made by liberal feminism uh, and to the more revolutionary voices that have spoken through its pages uh, over the years. 
Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, that's all from me. I apologize for the fact that you were unable to see um, uh, the first few of my slides. I'll hand back to Becky now um, to introduce Marila and Jilly. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, it's the, we, and I'm sure the themes that you raised there we're going to come back to in all three, in the next two papers as well. So I'm going to move straight to Lynn now. Are you there, Lynn? I think, Lynn, are you there? Where's Lynn? And sorry, everyone, for the technical problems. Can you, can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. We can That's see so you and I'm Lovely. so pleased. OK. That's okay. <laughs> marvellous. Um, I'll hand you over to Lynn. And again, Lynn, I'll, I'll pitch up back here if you start running over. But otherwise, um, I look forward to your talk. Excellent. OK. Politics makes comics of us all, or we would weep, Sheila Rowbottom wrote four decades ago. It was a prescient thought on the shifting place of feminism in the world at large, and The Guardian in particular. Her pioneering work, Women's Consciousness, Man's World, began by noting that the new feminism calling itself women's liberation seemed to have sprung suddenly from nowhere, neither from first wave feminism with its demand for equal rights, nor from Marxist currents of 60s radicalism, which tended to see feminism as a distraction from class politics. Instead, its immediate source was the contradictions facing feisty young women at the close of the 60s, eager to join men in fighting for a new, more egalitarian world, but finding themselves everywhere marginalized by male comrades. When The Guardian first heard these murmurings, it was not impressed with Jill Tweedy writing a rather mocking article on the first women's group, the Tufnell Park group, and Mary Holland reporting condescendingly on the very first Women's Liberation Conference in Oxford in February 1970, entitled Hellbent on Women's Liberation. She questioned what these extremely liberated young women are doing, advocating what looks like a new ghetto for women, and why they don't see their path in more generalized political activities. There was no discussion, she said, of general political issues. So back then, Holland could only accept the words of the trade union activists who spoke as political, citing Audrey Wise, a, a trade union organizer, who she said made a bold claim for a broadly based socialist movement, arguing that feminism is not enough. I want liberation to be a movement for people as people. Actually, Audrey Wise, who went on to become an MP, was herself soon the staunchest supporter of women's liberation, with much to say about women as women and what they brought to political struggle, stressing the different values they could put into trade union work, a necessary step, she said, for making connections between working life and home life. But it would take longer to convince the world that home life itself was not some sacrosanct space that could be seen as political. The point being, of course, to redraw the political. Fortunately, things changed quickly, at least among some Guardian women. When 3,000 women staged the very first liberation march, 7th of March 1971, Tweedy was among them, now reporting favorably and even worrying that women's liberation might prove to be too nice, rejecting anger almost before it began. Tweedy never looked back in her sadly short life, though always describing herself as a faint-hearted feminist, faint-hearted especially about women's liberation, uh, sorry, about women's sexual liberation. In contrast, that same year, Michael Baer, then writing regularly for The Guardian, interviewed Becky Friedan in How to Be Voluble, Sexy and Liberated. Friedan, he said, was a sort of liberal feminist a male journalist could applaud. She has no hatred or resentment of men as some later recruits to women's liberation have. She states publicly and repeatedly that a world of aggressive maleness is unattractive to men as to women. Privately, she says the same about aggressive femaleness, liberalism personified. Yet the evolving face of feminism did find a home of sorts in The Guardian, at least on its women's page. As we've just heard, its first Editor Linford aimed to address the intelligent women <coughs> covering 
and the domestic issues. Next editor, Evelyn War, introducing Holtby in Britain before the page was suspended for two decades, then bouncing back in the 50s with Mary Stott, primarily addressing an equal rights agenda, white women whom you could, she assumed would be primarily in the home. By the mid 70s, however, the Guardian Women's Page finally really caught up with women's liberation. Appointed in 1975, its new editor, Suzanne Lowry, later noted, it became impossible to avoid the heady days of women's lib. It came as a surprise to her as she'd never read or related to any women's page or joined any women's group prior to her appointment. It was more of a surprise to Guardian editor Peter Preston, who was looking, he told her, for a rather low-key womansy tone, distant from the ardour and militancy of women's liberation. That movement then, of course, was eager to transform the world on every front from an poor and inclusive egalitarian world at least in its dominant socialist feminist version, with men sharing in work and home alike, while also, of course, mocking men's grip on their old, old privileges. Polly Toynbee, too, recalled Preston inviting her to write a regular common column for the women's page in 77, though she'd written little about women before. Preston was proud, she said, but instinctively alarmed at the feminism creeping into the Guardian women's page. Things went awry again when Preston appointed Liz Forgan at the close of the 70s, hoping she would deflect the irritating militant feminism. She came to the Guardian from the Evening Standard, as she recalled later, without the slightest interest in women or the women's movement. However, she added, I surrendered quickly to a powerful and fascinating movement. <clears throat> Sorry. I surrendered quickly to a powerful and fascinating movement which has colored the way I see the world ever since. Poor Peter. For just as 70s liberations demanded, she said feminism had cracked open the rigid distinction between the proper news agenda and questions about how people lived their lives. Feminism, she said, was simply the most interesting thing on the political horizon, with the women's page soon a tight-knit, soon tight-knit and cliquey, covering what she called the dazzling agenda of women's liberation. Some of that writing, she continued, was the best in the paper. It was a time when women's journalism was shocking, fascinating, important and hilarious. And the sense of breaking new ground and shining new light on old issues, exhilarating. Meanwhile, Forgan noted the men on the paper ranged from strong supporters to many who were shocked and embarrassed. With the women's page now the most distinctive feature of The Guardian, she concluded, no journalist could ask for more. Yet Preston continued to press for less appointing the economic journalist Francis Cancross to edit the page in the 80s. It was a bizarre choice, Cancross said, though by then the radicalism of second wave feminism was declining or at least remained easier to overlook with the individualistic anti-welfare trade union movement bashing ideology of Thatcherism. By the 1990s, while face feisty feminist columnists like Libby Brooks and Becky Gardner still covered women's issues, Claire Longrig would reflect that even on the women's page, women weren't interested in feminism. They were interested in work and removing obstacles to their progress. We campaigned for paternity leave, affordable childcare and equal pay. Meanwhile, history was being rewritten, muffling the memory of 70s feminism. Forgan's dazzling movement had declined. And Sheila Rowbottom, for instance, like the feminist, the socialist feminism she helped create, had been marginalized even within feminism itself, especially that migrating to the feminist academy. As Melissa Benn wrote in The Guardian in 2000, in homage to Sheila, she had become a ghost at the feast of the politics she helped create. In fact, many of us left feminists were still publishing, performing and active and active in diverse settings. 
But The Guardian was reflecting more the uneven shifts within feminism with the media helping to promote its liberal aspirational face. In 2003, Zoe Williams still herself complaining that women remain terribly unequal as Kira Cochrane, who became editor, women's editor in 2006, agreed, yet both also reported how very unpopular feminism had become, not something for The Guardian. By 2007, Libby Brooks was writing that whilst 70s feminists were still seen by many as po-faced, anti-sex, misandrous, that's me, having just written a book celebrating straight sex, but still, and feminism was always beset by infighting. Such fighting, according to um, Libby, could be seen as empowering, a good scrap about what we believe in. Not so many took that up. The Guardian then gained its first woman editor-in-chief in 2015, Catherine Viner. But it's hard now to find any women's page in my printed Guardian, although the topic women appears tellingly under lifestyle <coughs> on the, uh, in the online paper, along with a men's head header. Meanwhile, some Guardian women were all too eager to help bury those hopes of 70s feminism. Despite the excitement of her fellow <coughs> feminist journalist, Polly Toynbee was always largely dismissive of the significance of the women's liberation movement. The truth is, there never was such a movement, she said some 20 years ago. All the leaders of feminist thought were subjected to unremitting shrewish vituperation from their sisters. All of them were, truth to tell, essentially individualistic thinkers and writers, not mass movement joiners. Germain was never a group. Truth to tell, this is simply hogwash. Germain never claimed to be part of the women's movement, seeing it as ugly and boring. And movements by definition move and also split especially in difficult times and everywhere, socialism and the left were in retreat. But while our hopes were dashed, there's hardly a left feminist activist I knew who is not still close to others in their old feminist network. These are the friends who has traveled with us into our old age with the ups and downs of progressive politics. Some of those CR groups literally survive. Other feminists like me remain just as close now to many of our feminist comrades as we were back in the 70s. Many of us remaining in activist groups. Now, Polly herself endorsed the recent writing of Misbehaving, written by those women, first women's liberationists, friends still, who took part in that first Miss World protest. Older feminist economists remain in the women's budget group peace activists in anti-war groups, anti-racists supporting South Hall Black Sisters, still active after 42 years and more. Perhaps Polly never recovered from her visit to Spare Rib in 82, when she was told by Sue Sullivan and Ruth Walsgave that The Guardian was essentially liberal and reformist, and like all liberals, moved with the fashion, while adding that lesbianism was an option all women needed to think about. Not Polly, I suspect. Other ex-Guardian journalists also choose to reduce feminism to its recent media-celebrated liberal variant. In her important new book, The Labours of Love, Madeleine Bunting claims that feminism has forged ahead on many fronts, but a recognition and valuing of care is noticeably absent. That too is nonsense. Ignoring second wave feminism's commitment to nurseries, community building, and continued promotion of democratized caring infrastructures. Who wrote the recent Care Manifesto, I wonder? Thus, while some Guardian women were sprinkled with the stardust of transformative feminism, others sought cover. Strangely, Toynbee and Bunting both remained close to some of those earlier feminist struggles, seeking welfare change, though true to the Guardian's dominant liberal traditions, hoping for change to come from the top, 
not bellowing for it, as many of us still do from below, like the five million women who joined Spain's feminist strike in 2018, the colorful sisters uncut here, or the strength of women leading the Black Lives Matter protests. Registering some of this, I'll finish in just one minute, Jane Martison wrote in 2013, feminism and the rights of women have become more vibrant and important in the past few years with everything from the horrific gang rape in India, everyday sexism, campaigns of malaria, um, bringing feminism back onto the global agenda. But this hardly does justice to recent feminist militancy, still fighting on all fronts now against violence, for shorter working time, for universal benefits, for an end to racism, for a radical care agenda, for a greater amount of socialist municipalism. These are some of the diverse sites of dissidents against the obscene inequality of four decades of neoliberal hegemony, dismantling and outsourcing our human infrastructures, impacting above all on women, black, ethnic minority and vulnerable people everywhere. No renewed Guardian women's page could tackle this agenda in any joined up way without confronting capitalism itself. And of course, it might now need to open itself up to all genders and none. And there's another challenge we'll perhaps hear a little more about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. And, that, and you have pretty much just introduced our next speakers <laughs> about how you've ended. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to, with no further ado, move to Mariella and Jilly. I'm not sure which of you is going to present first. Yes, hi, Mariella, hi. Um, hi. Thank you. Uh, over to you. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you want to ask questions at the end of this final presentation, if you could put them in the chat or raise your hands and either way you'll be drawn to my attention afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. In our chapter, we looked at what at first seems an odd coincidence that between 2015 and 2019, the dominant strain of feminist commentary in The Guardian had combined the rejection of the Corbyn left with the pushback against what was at the time the growing acceptance of transgender people in the British media landscape. Now, we argue that that is not a coincidence at all, but the shared effect of a women's spaces logic inherent to essentialist feminism in the liberal British press over the past half decade or so. In The Guardian, this meant the dismissal of the Corbyn project as inherently misogynist and the presentation of transgender women as a threat to women's rights in ways that betrayed journalistic values, but were, as we argue, politically and psychologically expedient to a centrist broadsheet in crisis. I begin with a very brief sketch of hostile feminist commentary about Jeremy Corbyn in The Guardian during his term as a leader of the Labour Party. So on the day of the 2015 Labour leadership election, Suzanne Moore complained that men had won because the new brochalism had refused to procure a woman leader. Polly Toynbee likewise bemoaned the loss of what she considered Harriet Harman's legacy of making Labour the choice for women, despite the interim leader's questionable rec record on abstaining on Tory cuts to child tax credits. Corbyn's initial shadow cabinet had more women than Harmon's and in the working with women policy document pledged universal free childcare and the end of Tory cuts to services for survivors of sexual and domestic violence. Yet the document was barely mentioned in the paper. Meanwhile, still on day one, Yvonne Roberts argued in an opinion piece that women's numerical representation in politics was more important than the content of policies. As Helen Lewis had declared in a commentary a month earlier, feminist voters must be expected to put this aspect of their identity over party loyalty when they go to the ballot box. Unsurprisingly, by October 2015, Gabby Hinsliff was able to write not only as if the new political um, leaders offer a le the new political leader of the La Labour Party's offer to women voters didn't matter, but as if it had never been made in the first place. And I quote, Jeremy Corbyn just isn't that into us female voters, unquote. The direction of travel was clear. The assertion was that women presented a unified constituency to be adequately served by a politics that had as its only content 
the promise that women be represented by women. However, after Labour's defeat in 2019, this did not stop the Guardian sister paper, The Observer, from running an opinion piece endorsing Keir Starmer as the feminist choice for new Labour leader. We might add that, fast forward to 2021, this is the logic that culminated in one Guardian and one Observer opinion piece this month by Gabby Hinsliff and Barbara Ellen respectively, just stopping short of hailing Prince Philip as the greatest feminist of the age. Now, a crucial detail in the consistently negative portrayal of Corbyn in the paper was that it actually claimed to do so from the conceptual space of the left. Free to dream, I'd be left of Jeremy Corbyn, but we can't gamble the future on him, runs a now notorious Polly Toynbee headline in August 2015. Feminist opinion pieces supplemented this wider pattern in commentary and editorials of cultivating a moral high ground to supplant left politics with an invaluable twist. They established the idea that left projects in the hands of men were rendered inherently worthless by inevitable sexism. The final step of this trajectory is to reject organized left politics at large. When, in 2016, Julie Bindle writes for The Guardian that, yet again, males on the left have let women down, the entire left is dismissed as a brochalist male monoculture. Overall, liberal feminist commentators successfully shirked from engaging with a left movement that was substantially supported by female voters, organized by women in crucial roles, especially at grassroots level, and made women's issues a key political concern. One might even say that by dismissing, by, by dismissing all left politics as male and sexist, such commentators installed a women's only space in political discourse, not in order to raise women's issues, but to preserve the status quo and avoid political argument altogether. Now, in our chapter, we argue that during the period in question, The Guardian showcases a peculiar brand of what we call neoliberal crisis feminism. It fits a neoliberal mold, even as it claims to occupy the space of the left, as it is interested in substituting centrist women leaders for men in a political landscape that it would leave substantially unchanged. Yet, despite this evident investment in the status quo, this feminism also requires the simulation of political collective, the stimulation of righteous anger and the affirmation of shared grievances. So in Nancy Fraser's term, a romance of, romance of feminism without a political project to match. This double stance we suggest can be understood as the maneuvers of centrism in crisis, the economic and political upheavals of austerity, Brexit, the election of Trump and Labour's left turn under Corbyn meant that The Guardian had to contend with the loss of the wider third way consensus alongside its thus far undisputed claim to speak for the centre left. Meanwhile, mainstream feminism itself no longer delivers in material terms, even for readers, readers of The Guardian. The effective rewards of an essentialist feminism based on the chimera of 70s separatism and directed against scapegoats, in this case, a falsely over-masculinized left and trans women, had to work overtime to paper over the cracks. So to conclude my section before handing over to Jilly, it's worth remembering that already in the 70s, feminists like Audre Lorde warned that a retreat into essentialism and separatism was a political dead end for women, serving as one editorial in American feminist paper It Ain't Me Babe puts it in 1970, can only carve an enclave in which we can bear the status quo more easily. The cultural enclave carved for women at The Guardian in the second half of the 2010s went one better it actively propped up the status quo and a status quo that meant rapid downward mobility for, for most women in the country. That's it from me. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you, Marila. Um, so the progressive feminist gloss given to the Guardian's, Guardian's hostility to Corbynism and its dismissal as, of, as brochialism also dovetailed with an increased hardening towards trans rights um, at the newspaper since the mid 2010s. So the Guardian has a much longer um, and troubling history of pitting 
uh, feminism against trans rights. So the Guardian and Observer notably published some um, egregiously transphobic columns in the noughties by feminists such as um, Jermaine Greer and Julie Bindle. Um, in 2010, though, it seemed um, that perhaps The Guardian was open to expanding the narrow terms of debate um, around trans when it began to publish A Transgender Journey, a blog series written by Juliet Jakes, documenting her gender reassignment that ran until 2012. Um, and the early 2010s arguably saw a period of relative openness um, to trans voices at The Guardian and to expanding the narrow terms of trans media visibility. <clears throat> Since the mid 2010s, however, the centre left British media um, spearheaded by The Guardian and also um, the New Statesman has become increasingly hostile towards trans people, especially trans women. Um, and many commentators have noted the peculiar specificity of the UK in this regard. So while in the UK, um, um, while in the US, sorry, transphobia is spearheaded by the Christian right and the Republican Party. In the UK, it is seemingly the liberal left and certain prominent feminists who are at its forefront. Um, a key moment came in 2017 when the then Prime Minister Theresa May announced a consultation on the Gender Recognition Act of 2004. In the context of alarmism about the implications of gender self-identification that arose, the phenomenon of, of what has come to be known as trans-exclusionary radical feminism emerged. So this phenomenon was born out of a broader media ecology involving the parenting website Mumsnet, social media and other newspapers, um, but The Guardian played a particular and powerful role. An editorial published in 2018 entitled The Guardian View on the, Ge the Gender Recognition Act, Where Rights Collide, was widely seen as marking an emboldened trans hostile position at the paper. This editorial ostensibly sought to present a balanced view, considering both the need to challenge transphobia and misogyny. However, it was precisely the positioning of trans rights and women's rights as competing or colliding that undergirded a notion of feminism as um, characterised in the first and last instance by a commitment to sex based rights. <clears throat> it argued that, and I'm quoting, while campaigners for trans rights are entitled to push for laws that they believe advance equality, feminists are entitled to question whether such changes could adversely affect other women. Gender identity does not cancel out sex. Women's oppression by men has a physical basis and to deny the relevance of biology when considering sexual inequality is a mistake. Women's concerns about sharing dormitories or changing rooms with male bodied people must be taken seriously." <clears throat> Unquote. Significantly, Guardian journalists in the US published a very strong disavowal of this editorial and what they what they called um, these unsubstantiated, outdated and offensive arguments, which they argued, um, quote, promoted transphobic viewpoints, including some of the same assertions about gender that US politicians are citing in their push um, to eliminate trans rights, unquote. A number of trans workers at the UK Guardian resigned around about this time and in March 2020 hundreds of staff and contractors from across the Guardian um, internationally signed a letter to the editor Catherine Viner in protest at the newspaper's quote pattern of publishing transphobic content which has interfered with our work and cemented our reputation as a publication hostile to trans rights and trans employees unquote. This letter was itself produced in response to a third trans employee of The Guardian quitting within a year, um, this time after the publication of a column by Suzanne Moore um, entitled Women Must Have the Right to Organise, We Will Not Be Silenced, um, which pitted again women's sex based rights against what she called transgender ideology. <clears throat> Here we see a claim that transgender ideology erodes the possibility of feminist collective action and that it is rather sex class feminism which is based on meaningful solidarity and this links into um, a broader pattern in which centrist rejection of Corbynism at the Guardian postured as the real left. <clears throat> So Corbyn supporters were dismissed as childish, um, narcissistic virtue signalers, um, as claimed, for example, in a <clears throat> column by Jonathan Friedman. While true left politics um, was to be found in adult centrist restraint, as Marila has already shown. Um, 
So by claiming the place of the left's rightful heirs, um, centrist commentators were able to shrug off the duty to address the substance of any views to the left of their own. And so too did um, trans-exclusionary feminist commentary claim itself as left um, while undermining um, the only meaningful possibility of the left taking power in the UK um, as anti-woman brochialism. Um, so a column by Suzanne Moore um, claimed, quote, left wing feminists, me included, see women as a sex class. Um, the backlash is now here. And in some cases, it comes in the form of an ideology that overrides the demands of women. And that's the end of that quote. Um, we identify this as part of a neoliberal feminism um, that differs in important ways from the corporate lean in um, style of neoliberal feminism, which has been identified by <clears throat> Catherine Rottenberg and others. Um, and this is precisely because um, this feminism names itself as left um, and the rhetorical posturing as the true feminist left papered over a profound lack of support for Labour's um, under Corbyn's redistributive economic policies, which represented the only meaningful possibility um, of shifting the political terrain leftwards in a way that would benefit women, trans people and all people. Um, as such, we argue it's um, the Guardian has played a key role in the neoliberalisation of feminism by splitting it off um, ever further from its grounding in the left and in the politics of redistribution. <clears throat> and that's the, that's the end. Thank you so much, um, Jilly and Marila. That was really fascinating. Um, it, it's a. It's, can everyone see me in my back? Yep. Um, it, it, it's a. It's a interesting thing in a panel where it's all women is nobody goes over their time <laughs> so uh, just an observation um thank you so much for the, all three talks they're all really interesting and um, we have just one question coming in from the audience at the moment so if i can encourage others to ask their questions in the chat that would be really fantastic because it'd be nice to get a debate going um but meanwhile what, what strikes me about the kind of um a common thread in what all three of you have been, or four of you, sorry, have been saying is this idea of of um, of the the women's page and and the, as a kind of space for women and and what is done with that space and how much is it how much is it a radical space and how much is it Im impossible for it really to be a radical space and I, I think that's particularly um, interesting to explore that a little bit at the moment because. There is at the moment no women's page since the the print edition down page because of covid or possibly before that there seems to be some confusion about when the women's page actually stopped but there isn't a women's page at the moment so do you think on reflection given that it has sometimes been a space for kind of radical pieces as you've all acknowledged as well is that a good thing a bad thing do we want to campaign for the women's page to return or not what would you say i don't know who wants to go first lynn why don't you go first? OK, um, I think it's very hard to say. I think I can't see a campaigning women's page emerge now because I think the issues we're up against are so vast and and really do require you know, an overall critique of neoliberal capitalism. Uh, and I can't see Guardian journalists at the moment taking that up. I think we might get the occasional article, but I, for instance, haven't been able to write to the for The Guardian for at least 15 years. Um, I don't quite see it, <laughs> not with the people currently working there. Now, if you would go back, Becky, and a few others, maybe things might change, but I'm not sure. <laughs> How about um, Hannah? What do you think? Um, well, I, I mentioned at the start of my talk that, of course, that the, the debates continue uh, uh, to rage amongst uh, feminist journalist studies scholars, uh, feminist journalism studies scholars, uh, uh, and others about um, uh, uh, the continued necessity or not of um, women's pages in uh, newspapers. Um, and I don't know if you'll allow me to become uh, slightly personal and anecdotal uh, 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 for the moment. I, I have to say that I, I like. 
I, I'm saddened by the absence of the, the women's page because I developed my feminist consciousness at the height of millennial post-feminism, where um, uh, the, the extent to which people were uh, talking about feminism at all in um, mainstream culture and commentary had diminished so dramatically. Um, and the, the, there was a certain extent to which I, I, I seized upon the feminist writing that I saw taking place in um, the uh, Guardian women's page. Uh, so... Uh, at a time when it was so difficult for um, uh, ordinary young uh, people to talk about feminism and to, and to find uh, spheres in which it was being talked about uh, uh, candidly uh, as something that continues to be socially relevant. Um, yeah, that's where I developed my feminist consciousness. And so, uh, I mean, and that doesn't join up with where, where we are in the present in light of all the things that especially Jilly and Marila have uh, uh, been uh, talking about. Um, but I guess I, I, I would hope that there is still um, a space for feminist writing uh, uh, in a women's page. That's all for me. And, and, and uh, Jilly and, and Marila, what do you think? Do you want to go first, Marilla? <laughs> oh, Marilla, you're muted. <clears throat> you're muted. muted. You're still muted, Marilla. Can you hear me now? Yes. Lovely. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a nice idea, but I find it difficult to consider it in abstract given the context and also the sort of very material context. Uh, there's uh, statistics that um, Justin Schlossberg mentioned in, in his piece in, 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 in the edited collection um, that it looks like with the subscriber model, the vast majority of subscribers now do tend to be uh, described themselves as being on the center right. And, you know, <laughs> is that... Is it, are those subscribers going to support a, a radical women's page and are they going to be interested in it? So, you know, I, a lot of things would have to change both, you know, in the bigger financial and structures and the, just, just so much, even on that basic level. Um, but, you know, of course, I think generally, um, you know, of course, cultural change has to start somewhere. And if, if, the, if this was possible to get an interesting radical team of, of of feminists to, to to you know start helping um, change the Guardian over, then that would be that would be great. But it's it's difficult to see exactly where those resources are to come from right now. Although I suppose, that as you acknowledged in your own talk, the the when the um, Guardian editorial that you mentioned came out, it was then resisted internally by younger journalists in the in the Guardian. And one thing that interests me is that there's a you know, we talk about the sort of the, the tension in the women's page as being, on the one hand, a, a platform for some radical sort of individual pieces and voices, and on the other hand, a kind of stepping stone for women's careers within journalism. And I think the women's page historically was was often somewhere where journalists sort of start, were at a bit of an earlier stage in their career edited it, certainly in, in more recent years. And I wonder whether if there was still that space it might shift the power balance slightly internally, but who knows? I don't know. Julie, what, what um, do you want to add to thing? Or? Um, I guess just to agree with what, what's been said um, already, but I guess also it would be a, a question probably of, of of thinking about what kind of feminism, you know, how, how, how feminism would be defined and what kind of feminist ethos might sort of uh, um, shape that particular space. Um, because I guess like as me and Marila have been sort of very concerned about the particular political ends to which feminism has been put. So, yeah, so I guess it's I mean, I think that the idea of it is is exciting and wonderful, but I think it would be, you know, it, it, it would con need to be uh, with a, a very kind of. Um, it would need a. a, a sort of radical rethinking of what feminism actually means and you know in particular what feminism means in this in this neoliberal moment and um yeah so that would be my just what i would add to that <clears throat> i want to i've had a question from jenny turner which i'll just um read out here so she says i have a question for jillian perhaps others 
I read an article by a US journalist last week, I can't remember her name, I think someone actually did post the name in the chat afterwards, um, who compared the users of Mumsnet in the UK, who compared the way users of Mumsnet in the UK seem to be influenced by the sites to become transphobic to the way lonely male users can be radicalised into nasty incel politics via the so-called manosphere. What do you think of this parallel? Very good question. Thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you. It's a really good question. Um, and yeah, Mariah and I both read this piece um, <clears throat> just just recently. It's a really, really interesting piece. And yeah, Mariah's posted it. it was in, written by somebody called Katie Baker in Lux magazine. Um, so, I mean, I think what this speaks to is that, the, the, you know, this kind of the particular kind of trans exclusionary feminism that <clears throat> that we identified in the Guardian is part of this much bigger kind of ecosystem of which Mumsnet is a really significant player um, as well. Um, I think probably Marila can say something more about this as she's had some very interesting thoughts about this particular piece. <laughs> what it might have well. I mean, um, <laughs> thank you, Jilly. Well, we were talking about this earlier, and I guess one thing that stood out um, as interesting to us is this idea that this sort of particular mumsnet radicalization of um, people who then become TERFs, as it were, actually often is bound up with a very particular moment of vulnerability and a moment of sort of potential sort of politicization, which is the moment after women have given birth for the first time and for, the, for many of them for the first time actually have this sort of kind of um, potential feminist awakening of realizing actually no, being a woman is different and you do, you do disappear um, from, from public life. There is no proper um, healthcare postnatally or prenatally. Um, uh, there is no um, proper ch um, affordable um, childcare. So overall, it's a pretty um, miserable experience becoming a woman in Britain at this moment. And that actually then uh, Mumsnet somehow really managed to pull that potential, potential political energy towards this uh, negative, um, hateful, scapegoating discourse. Um, so what's what interested Gillian me here is that this is very different from the kind of turfism that we were interested in in The Guardian. You might say one is turfism from below and The Guardian one is the turfism from above. And, uh, you know, and it is important uh, to draw that distinction, however much they're also obviously um, in connection with each other online, um, to see that it's a, it's a vulnerability to fall for the effective rewards of this um, sort of scapegoating. Um, and but to go back to the Guardian to see that here we have something different. We, here we have extremely privileged journalist, um, a, extremely privileged journalistic culture, um, which is harnessing this um, this turfism in order to cover up what, it, at least in our analysis, their own um, political confusion or their own political anxiety about the fact that you can no longer say you are a feminist and be a centrist because it's so abundantly clear as Sue Watkins has also brilliantly recently shown in a, a long piece for the New Left Review that mainstream feminism no, wonder, no longer bears rewards even for middle class women. It's no longer true that going out there in the workplace is ultimately materially rewarding um, in, in this particular economic moment that we're in. So we, we thought it was interesting from, from that particular perspective. That, uh, Sorry, Lynn, wrong answer. to come in, I wasn't sure. Me? Yes, I wasn't yes, sure if yes, you were. Did, yes, um, oh, I have so much to say. And the first thing is the tragedy, you know, that the uh, nonsensical diversion into trans exclusionary rhetoric um, takes us away from everything that is still important about feminism and particularly, of course, something we weren't mainly engaged in before which is green politics, um, the politics of climate change and so on. So I think, you know, for um, old socialist feminist activists like me, still active in so many places, women's budget group and, and you know, green new movements and, and Petipa and so on, is precisely that, you know, we have to have this inclusive movement, obviously inclusive trans, I mean, that's just ridiculous, obviously, um, to engage with the issues of the moment. And many feminists actually are uh, but you know we're being sidelined by you know rightly you know having to bash out this um anti-trans rhetoric and, and and say what inclusivity is all about inclusivity is actually as i see it uh, today some sort of anti-capitalist movement you know anti-capitalist 
anti-capitalism as we know it that takes on board the unbelievable threats that we're facing, you know, the carelessness of everything around us, which is why, you know, with others I wrote the care manifesto. You know, there's so much for us to be doing, so much that we are doing, and yet we're, we're, we're having to combat, you know, this ridiculous sideline of issues that a few people are taking up in the name of feminism, you know, nothing to do with my feminism, you know, nothing to do with most of the older feminists I know, except a few of them. And uh, yeah. an inclusive movement, uh, that's what you begin from. Okay. Everyone's nodding. Everyone in the street is nodding. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I have another question for the audience, but I just want to um, just uh, say one more question of my own, really, which is I, one thing that struck me a lot when I was listening to all of you was something that Gary Young said in his talk last night. Um, I don't know if any of you were at that. I know you were, Lynn, but um, he said that uh, maybe what the left needs is not a newspaper, but a movement. And I wonder if the same is, is true for feminism. We look to The Guardian, and those of us who remember the heyday of The Guardian's women page look, look to it and sort of expect so much of it. Um, but maybe what, what we need to be putting our energy into is building a movement. And I did do a, a little search just before this. I was interested in how and whether The Guardian was still giving space to the more radical parts of feminism at the moment. So I did a search for Sisters Uncut. And it was interesting because, just to give a couple of examples, the Daily Mirror had mentioned it 30 times, Sisters Uncut 30 times, the Times has mentioned it 18 times, um, the, the Cosmopolitan four times, the Morning Star not at all, zero times, Daily Mail not at all, zero times, um, and the Guardian 107 times, including three pieces by Sisters Uncut activists. So there is still that space there for the taking, in a way. That's what it made me feel. But it has to become irresistible pressure, perhaps, from there being such interesting things. What Lim was saying as well about the dynamism of second wave feminism and how that became a kind of irresistible force for the Guardian and maybe maybe we will see those times again maybe we are beginning to see those times again that would be a, a nice thought I don't know if but that relationship between the movement and the Guardian I wondered whether um, anyone wanted to speak to that yes I can't see the Guardian again as in its current form, being very open to movement politics. You know, you know, the women's movement emerged at a particular time, you know, with the radicalism of the 60s dying down, and then suddenly this new radical voice appearing that was fresh and new. You know, now there's so many issues that we have to pay attention to. And, and for me, um, creating a caring world that goes across the board from how we care to each other for each other to how we care for the world. That's the movement. That's the movement that I believe, you know, the International Women's Strike uh, group are involved in. You know, there's five million Spanish women who were in Barcelona in 2018. But, but you know, we are still fractured, not just by the silliness of um, turf debates and so on, but... Um, uh, uh, well, are we still fractured? I think we could try and create, I mean, you'd think post-COVID it would be easier to create a movement, wouldn't you? But, you know, we have very few voices now that are being listened to, certainly in the Labour Party. The Labour Party couldn't be more distinct from any radical movement politics. So, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get it into the media. So, um, I must say our care manifesto is selling extremely well, and hopefully lots of other things might be too. You know, we have to find a way of writing, you know, more popular manifestos. Verso is putting out a lot of manifestos and then, but, you know, we've got to do more than write manifestos. We have to be out there, don't we? I mean, for instance, the campaigns against privatisation, like, for instance, Centene now taking over 49 surgeries, they're the sorts of things that are going to hugely affect women, hugely affect our lives as the market takes over more and more of every space work that we once... Um, fought within, you know, when we fought for democratic control, it's, we've got such a struggle now to bring back any form of democratic control of almost anything, you know, as our public resources and public spaces are just being sold off. I, our move, 
we have little movements. They've got to unite. We've got to find, I think, a way of uniting against neoliberal capitalism, which in no way has gone away. Actually, the pandemic's been used by those uh, in power to um, to increase it. You know, they've privatised more things in the NHS and so on. We know, you know, the cronyism, it's all increased, not decreased. So, you know, we're up against so much. Surely we can uh, try and find ways of coming together to combat that. It, and it won't be just feminism, will it? It will have to be feminism together with an essential part of eco-politics and class politics, anti-racist politics and so on. Just just to add to that, um, you know, I, I agree with uh, Lynn's pes pessimism on The Guardian right now, but I think you raise a really interesting question there, Becky, about that um, connection between movement and the paper and actually specifically to highlight a particular sort of pattern throughout this conference so far of always going back to the sense, well, what you need isn't a paper, it's a movement. Well, of course, the first answer is yes, indeed, we need a movement. And yes, indeed, we do not need the Guardian for that movement and they can't stop us, um, number one. But number two, I mean, it, it, it feels to me that that uh, it seems to me that that sort of sense of it's almost there's a certain defensiveness built into that. Well, you don't need a paper, you want a movement. Well, that is very clear. And we do not expect a liberal paper to be our best friend and ally. However, this liberal paper needs to be held to account according to its own standards. First of all, the sanctity of facts that's been so shockingly and, you know, uh, unforgettably, um, um, you know, um, dismissed over, over, this, over this period. Um, but also this sense that this is a newspaper, this is journalism. It's supposed to report on what's going on in the country, what's going on. And both in terms of, so on the one hand, we get this, this um this movement you know corbynism that was so shockingly misrepresented then on the other hand we get you know trans people who simply just want to be allowed to exist involved in this fake battle which is, gets completely overblown which gets completely over reported in the guardian in comparison to other um papers m turned into something that is fake that doesn't even exist as such in the real world and you know to the extent of actually helping to radicalize people online into like into kind of a sort of whirlpool of hate um, when really you know even as a liberal paper what it ought to do is to report of course it's going to have a li liberal opinion pieces but it, it should be more open to as you know, Gary also said in his keynote, to just be curious about what's going on and to give it a fair hearing. And this hasn't happened. And the way that it stands at the moment, it's, it is difficult to see um, whether there's a way back to that, if, if, if ever there was that any kind of, um, you know, honouring of, of that claim that they have themselves. But at the very least, I feel like we need to help hold them to account quite besides of, um, you know, what goes on with the movement alongside. Thank you. Thank you. I see. <laughs> Is there anyone to add to that? Very good points that Marielle has made. Um, I would just add, I think that I think um, anecdotally, I think um, younger feminists and feminists on the left um, would would be moving away from from the Guardian and not not see it as a as a home of feminism that speaks to them and the, and the, what they see as the sort of most important political um, issues. Um, yeah, so you know this kind of um, this fixation on on trans issues as some you know. Um, the, the sort of collision between trans rights and women's rights is somehow the defining feature of feminism is completely, like Lynn says, a complete sort of diversion and distraction from what actually younger feminists are much more interested in. Um, and I think, um, well, Kia Milburn's work is interesting on, on Generation Left, pointing to how, you know, generationally <clears throat> younger people now are much are, are, are um, much more left wing. And there, this is a kind of a, a, um, an evidence shift. Um, Sort of demographic shift which is happening and so it's interesting then to think about how maybe if the membership model is potentially uh, potentially shifting the paper to the right in terms of in terms of who is subscribing as members then it seems to me that there's going to be maybe a greater divergence between the left and, fe and left feminism and the guardian um so i guess just to maybe add to that kind of pessimism of of, of where it might be going <laughs> Can I just put in a word for radical oldies, uh, uh, the young? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. The normal narrative. 
there is still a lot of radical oldies. And what we want is intergenerational links so that we can uh, share each other's, we can be attuned to new voices and, uh, you know, and for better or worse, the significance of our old struggles can be uh, attended to. Yes, sorry, I didn't. I'm sorry. I really, I didn't mean to create that false I, division. No, uh, I'm only <laughs> little point. Um, I want to make it with some questions are now coming in as we approach the end, which is, so I'm just going to go through some of these. So, um, Theodore, uh, thank you for your question. Theodore asks, could perhaps Gillian and Marielle uh, elaborate a bit on the crisis component of neoliberal crisis feminism? For those of us who have not yet got round to be reading the chapter mm. in Capitalism's Conscience, um, and what does the crisis bit signify or allude to? And, uh, and we have a couple more questions as well, but if I can put that one to you. Shall actually, what I might do is uh, read the next question also, which is from George, who says, John Pilger, for example, argues feminism is weaponized by The Guardian to smear anti-imperialists anti such as Julian Assange, and therefore The Guardian facilitates the destruction of lives of women in countries targeted by Western sanctions and militaries. Can you speak to this? So two questions there, if I can put that. Maybe Hannah, do you want to come in first? Um, or, or do you want me to go to um, Gillian? Here we go, Gillian. Yeah, yeah, might, that might have to sit with you for a minute on that one, Becky. Come to Hannah maybe later. Um, I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to speak. So yes, so the, the um, Theodore's question about the crisis part of neoliberal crisis feminism. Julie, did you want to do that? Do you want to? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, so uh, essentially, what we identify in the chapter is that um, a kind of a um, centrism more broadly is in crisis because it has no kind of political answers to uh, ravages of, of neoliberalism. It's sort of a political dead end. And so, by neoliberal crisis feminism, what we're pointing to um, is how what emerges. Um, um, in response to this, when 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 neoliberal centrism or answers um, neoliberal crisis feminism falsely fixates on kind of cultural issues because it cannot because it has no answers to the kind of structural economic crisis um, of neoliberalism. So um, it's a it's again it's this kind of like diversionary tactic to focus on on cultural issues uh, you know and, and this kind of like false debate around trans rights against women's rights as a way to kind of paper over the irreconcilable sort of political cracks in in you know in the fact that it has no kind of political answers um i don't know if you want to add anything to that Mariah, or if that's no the... that's that's perfect okay. thank you for that the the, the um I mean, we could talk more about that, but I just want to leave a bit of time for the final question, which is this idea that, that feminism is weaponized by The Guardian to smear anti-imperialists anti and therefore The Guardian facilitates the destruction of lives of women in, in countries targeted. Um, well, as we know, perhaps, uh, Pilger always saw feminism as being we weaponized right, right from uh, the start as uh, another great uh, Guardian journalist, Yvonne Roberts, could... Uh, tell us and I do think it's true that um, um, feminism has been used as a way of trying to make Assange and um, the terrible things that have happened to him uh, less an issue although many of the people I know leading the Assange support campaign especially in Australia are actually women and feminists so it, it isn't quite as simple as he said just as you know many many feminists have been and are still involved in um, anti-imperialist work, you know, women against imperialism and so on, are still very much alive. And so um, it's, it's, it's fairly simplistic, I think, what, um, um, he, what, what Pilger is saying. Um, although, of course, you know, any voice can be used, you know, we, we can always use things in certain ways when we want to, but but I, I don't think that there, there's a deep reality to it that feminists are in any way really behind the failure to support Assange in any significant way. I guess what we might add to that is just it, it it's come to the point that it just means what it just hap, it matters what feminism means right now. And, yes. you know, feminism is claimed so much now as a label for just, you know, neoliberal lean in feminism. Yes, um, yes. Mm -hmm. 
and, and it's and it's interesting to see here what the role that essentialism and separatism have has played already in the 70s and that people in the 70s feminists in the 70s were already making the point that it's actually this turning away from the world this kind of um fetishizing of fetishizing of women as a special sort of species apart is actually already the first step towards neoliberal feminism because it tends to celebrate the achievement of the individual woman on the basis of her essential womanhood rather than thinking about collective projects and collective change. Um, so I guess in that sense, the kind of feminism that we've been critiquing in The Guardian in various ways, um, all of us, is the one that facilitates um, a kind of, well, a, a kind of, it, it stands in the way of, of, of real feminism because feminism is nothing if it's not a politics and a political project, you know. It's, you know, it's to fight against the oppression of women, not to fetishize the idea of womanhood to keep everything the same. So I guess it fits into that. Sorry. And the overwhelming majority of feminists, uh, no doubt, even so-called TERFs, are not neoliberal. I mean, I think neoliberal feminism is very much a product of the media. So when my friend Catherine Rottenberg writes her book on neoliberal feminism, it's all very interesting, but she's very much talking about media voices. And none of the feminists that I know found it easy to relate to because I thought, well, but that's not us. You know, they're all still as active as ever in their different ways in many places. Anna. Yeah, ju just to add to what um, Lynn's saying there, and I was thinking about this in relation to one of the previous questions that is being answered as well, that, um, that, that I, and I think it was in um, uh, 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 Lynn's response to um, the need to mobilise a movement, um, is I wonder if in, in, in some respects that, that, that we're still experiencing um, uh, in some ways a hangover from millennial post-feminism in this tendency uh, to view and talk about uh, feminism in terms of uh, cultural discourse and um, uh, uh, and that there, there is tendency, this tendency uh, to, to see the key feminist uh, debates and ideas taking place at the level of cultural uh, uh, discourse. And I wonder if that might link back to what um, uh, 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 Lynn was saying about um, uh, uh, some of the challenges involved in um, mobilising things as a movement. Um, yeah, just just an add on to what Lynn was saying there. That's very interesting. We've 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 run a minute over our time already. It's been such an interesting discussion, and we could carry on for hours. I know. And and um, thank you all so much for really really interesting papers. It's given me a lot to think about, certainly. Um, and uh, yeah, hope to see you all at the next big feminist march of, the, of kill the bill packs or one of these other very important <laughs> issues of feminism are of course at the forefront of as always and really? uh, thank you all so much and thanks to the audience and um, to remind you all we've got a couple more panels i believe and then we have um garda kami's uh, final keynote on israel palestine um to finish off the conference thank you all so much for coming and um yeah see you at the thank you, Becky. Thank you for having us. Nice to meet you all and to yeah, see you nice again. Nice to meet you. Yes. <laughs> Bye. 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 Goodbye, everybody. Meet again. Thank you so much for sharing, yeah. Becky. Yeah, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah.